take the uh, fucking spot. We are back in session. Parties and council are present. Our jurors that are not yet present. Uh, council indicated uh, he wanted to address something with the court before we uh, begin with the jury. Uh, yes, you are. A couple things. One, I'm going to have two individuals here from uh, Cyber Genetics and Craft Bar today. Okay. Uh, Mr. Poolholz, who is just the I, I engineer team computer. Uh, Mr. Dr. Perlin will be here to testify second. Is it okay if Dr. Perlin stays in for the first testimony? And then, okay, if she stays in for the testimony after she's done, since they kind of travel here sure. together. Um, second thing is, is during part of the presentation of Dr. Perlin, he has a PowerPoint he uh, created. Is it okay if um, he controls the PowerPoint for that? Is it okay also if he, instead of staying on the witness stand, comes before the jury as well, so that he can kind of direct them all of that? Sure. Okay. Uh, last well, as long as we have a hard copy of the PowerPoint to mark it, you can see I will print that out now, so we will have that. Um, and I still got to print out the pictures I took of the um, MBAC. Yeah. So I got to do that. I'll try to do both of those uh, this week, if not okay. today. Uh, lastly, the uh, issue that came up yesterday about the um, zoomed in electrofarograms yes. that we discussed, I emailed counsel to see if I can get a copy of all the ones that were done, idea of who did them, what program they used. Um, I got a name verbally today. Um, I asked for copies of it, and they said they're not going to give them to me because they were in evidence. I'm entitled to my own copy, and I want a complete copy of everything they did because there might be information in there that could be beneficial to me. I don't know. I'd like a chance to review it. So I'm requesting that the court um, give any guidance as to whether or not I'm entitled to have a copy of it. People are here. Yeah. Shockingly, that, that's a misrepresentation. I told him I would email him the, the five, I believe it's five that I have. Um, so for him to stand here and say to the court uh, that I refuse to give them to him, that's not true. Uh, I'm happy to even email them right now. Um, okay. That's what happened. All right. Uh, the court will order that uh, prosecution provide uh, uh, discovery copies of the uh, Rerun electro paragraph. No, okay, the, the process goes like this. The, the electro paragraphs are contained in what are called FSA files. FSA files can be read by numerous viewers. Um, so the file, the data is the same. The viewer may be different, but the file is the same. So it has not been reworked. Okay. It's just viewed through a different viewer. Okay. So uh, to provide copies of those to uh, the defense. And I would like copies of all the work that was done by the person that did the transaction, just not the one that people are using. Because if they may have just five they think are important, if he did 40, I want all 40. That's, first of all, there isn't any more. I will double check. Second of, all, second of all, if there was, they may not be entitled to it. They have the data. It's their data. They gave it to us. The data is there. Okay. And, and, and frankly, you can download free viewers of these files and do it yourself. Okay. Well, uh, whatever uh, copies uh, or reviews of the electrical program that she will have in order to provide to you. Okay. Okay. And just so we're clear, um, Ms. Mrs. Pujols is going to get some like to is doing the process and no interpretation. If the court is upholding that order, the Brown can go to that and cross to pretty much extend her testimony when Dr. Perlin is going to go through all of it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Were you going to return this thing? Yes. Okay. Good morning. The uh, record is flat. We are back in session. Parties and council are present. All members of our uh, jury and our alternates are present. And defense may call your next witness. Yes, defense calls Beatrice Pujol.
My name is Beatrice Pujols, B-E-A-T-R-I-Z-P-U-J-O-L-S. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pujols, by whom are you employed? I am employed with Cybergenetics. And what is your occupation at Cybergenetics? I am a forensic analyst. And do you have any special training or education to hold such positions? Yes, I do. Could you please detail what that is that's relevant to your Sure. As a forensic analyst, I analyze DNA case data using a computer software called TrueAllele. I am a certified basic Trulio operator, a certified advanced Trulio operator, and a reporting scientist for Trulio. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in biology with a minor in biochemistry, excuse me, and psychology, as well as a Master's of Forensic Science from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Perfect. Have you received any awards or honors? Uh part of your training? Yes, I did. Uh, for my bachelor's degree, I graduated cum laude, which means I had a high grade point average. I was one of the few students selected for the student travel grant by the Forensic Sciences Foundation, which allowed me to go to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences conference to present my master's thesis research. I was also awarded the uh, Forensic Science Award by the Forensic Science and Law Program at Duquesne University for maintenance and training on the instrumentation in the Forensic DNA Lab. Did you ever work in the DNA wet lab? Yes, during my time at Duquesne University, I conducted research in the Forensic DNA Lab. And by wet lab, what does that mean? A wet lab is a lab where you physically interact with the item and use different chemicals on it to do things like extract the DNA from the item. And have you ever performed any scientific studies on DNA? Yes, I have. For my master's thesis, I conducted a study attempting to improve the methods that a crime lab uses in processing sexual assault samples uh, of DNA. And I also conduct validation studies at Cybergenetics. Have you ever lectured or taught courses in relation to DNA or to forensic analysis? Yes, I have. Approximately how many have you done? Ballpark. I would say at least four. Okay. And what are the general topics? I usually lecture on DNA analysis using Trulial, uh, which falls under the probabilistic genotyping uh, field. Do you ever train others or supervise others in the um, use of the Trulial software? Yes, I do. I teach the science and software course at Cybergenetics to users in crime labs who are learning to use Trulial for their own DNA casework. Have you ever analyzed uh, uh, DNA data or information for a criminal case? Yes, I have. Have you ever qualified as an expert in the court of law regarding the analysis of DNA data? Yes, I have. Uh, I've qualified four times in Suffolk County in New York, once in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, once in Charleston, West Virginia, and once in Orofino, Idaho. Were you asked uh, to do a computer analysis of raw data that was provided by uh, Bodie Selmark uh, Lab under Bodie case number CCA 1845-0058? Yes, I was. And when did you do that analysis? I was provided the data, uh, the electronic data files associated with the DNA evidence in the case on December 10th of 2018, and uh, my analysis was uh, thereafter. <laughs> so when you get the digital data, what do you do with it? Once I receive those digital DNA data files, uh, I follow the cybergenetics protocol, which is to input those electronic files into the software, 
and then I asked Trulio, the computer, to analyze that data. Once it's done processing, I can ask it to make a comparison to known references. And when you analyze the data, what kind of information are you looking for before you do a comparison? Like number of contributors, is a mixture, is that, is that some of the stuff you're to look for? Yes. Uh, the first step in the protocol is to input the data into the software. Then I visually examine the data to ask a question of Trulio. So I look for number of contributors in the data. Um, is the data low? So are the peaks a lower level? Is there differential degradation? Which means are the contributors in the mixture perhaps degrading at different rates? And um, the number of cycles or how long the computer will run that sample. If you're looking at the number of contributors, why does that matter? Oftentimes, um, the evidence that we receive are mixtures, which means there's DNA from more than one person in the sample. What Trulio does is separate that mixture into individual contributors, and then we can make a comparison from those contributors to a known reference. And in this case, if you receive a known reference or a known reference data, uh, yes, I did receive uh, references for Joseph McStay Sr., Summer McStay, two McStay children, and Charles Merritt. And when you input this data and you want to do a comparison, well, let's, before I go there, in reviewing the data that was received from Bodhi Selmar, in reviewing the data from the comparison sample, did the data appear sufficient for you to do an analysis with Julia? Yes. Did you see any uh, obvious errors in the data that would not allow a comparison? No, the data is data. It's what comes from the uh, evidence item. Now, when you're going to do a comparison, are there different types of parameters uh, that can be uh, set in the program for the uh, comparison analysis? Not for the comparison part, but when setting up the request for Trulio to process the data, there are certain parameters uh, I can set as an analyst, um, always following protocol, of course, and that would be the peak height that I mentioned earlier, the number of contributors, uh, how long the computer would run. And when you say how long the computer can run, can you explain what that means? Yes, it means the number of cycles that the computer goes through in analyzing that sample. So let's just say um, if you want to run a sample that's a multiple contributor, how long is a general run? And how many cycles are in that time frame? Yes, a cycle could be uh, or a cycle parameter could be 100,000 cycles. So the computer goes through uh, the processing 100,000 cycles. And that's the standard processing? Yes. And do you look for artificial peaks in the data to uh, remove those so it doesn't affect the data? Yes. So sometimes there are artifactual peaks that stem from something in the machinery at the lab. So an analyst can visually examine the data and see those peaks and uh, remove them according to protocol. Uh, that occurred in this case. I ran the data with the artifact present and without the artifact present and disclosed both results. And did you have to set different parameters for the analysis of the data from OE cell mark in this case? What do you mean by different parameters? Like the, as you described, like the number of contributors, how long it ran, um, the height of peaks used, all the different parameters that can change by a run. Did you use any in this case? Yes, I did. So um, I set the peak height that the computer would use um, in order to use all the data to 5R view, which just accounts for the data being lower level, those peaks. I also turned on that differential degradation feature. 
I set the number of cycles to 100,000 or 25,000 according to protocol, and I also uh, removed those artifactual peaks. And when you did that, did you also have to put in the number of uh, assumed contributors to the sample? Yes, part of the protocol is to uh, set the number of contributors in the mixtures so true can then infer those evidence genotypes. So the decisions you're making on the parameter, you keep referring to protocol. Uh, can you describe what these protocols are and how they were developed? Yes. So protocols are the rules you would follow in using the software. Uh, they're developed by cybergenetics based on uh, validation studies and experience using the software. So it would tell you once you have a sample, what do you do with it? You upload it to the software. And then it would tell you what's next step. You visually examine the data and you create a request based on the examination of that data. And it walks you through the steps of what to do with the software. And you did that all in this case? Yes, I did. And how many uh, different runs did you have to do for the uh, raw data you received? May I refer to my notes? Sure. Thank you. So for each evidence item, the computers, computer runs were set up in triplicate, which we do in a standard procedure. Uh, we don't just run the computer once and are satisfied with the result. We run it multiple times to ensure reproducibility of those results. And so were the results reproducible? Yes, they were. And how many evidence items did you do this for? Seven evidence items. Seven evidence sites that are ran three times. That's a total of 21 different just analysis runs. Uh, also, take into account there, uh, the runs are typically for each contributor assumption. So, if an item was run for two and three contributors, that's triplicate for both two contributors and three contributors. Okay. <laughs> so, what you're saying is a lot of times this, this program is run on these samples. Yes. So you did some for two contributors, you did some for three contributors. You'll be able to put more contributors than that. For item EO9, I ran it as two, three, and four contributors. How about EO8? Yes. How about, how about item EO8? Item EO8, uh, I ran it as two and three contributors. And EO5? Uh, uh, two and three contributors. Yes, 
then a comparison was made. So then those 250 run results were then ran against five different samples? Yes. And how many times was each comparison done on that? Just once or did you do it three times again? There's just a one step comparison for each uh, genetic type that is inferred from each item versus a reference. So your the computer pretty much did 1,250 runs. Because it was 250 just for all the data and then you ran against five samples for comparison. Not quite. So there's the <laughs> computer runs. Um, and let's say uh, ran it for two contributors. So the computer infers two genetic types or separates two contributors from that evidence. So then the references each are compared to both of those uh, contributors in the mixture. And then it does the same if there's three contributors in that mixture and so on. But it's just a one-step <laughs> comparison. And so a sample is compared against a run result with two contributors and compared against a run result with three contributors. Is that data uh, kind of pushed together and analyzed together? Like if I want to do a result, see the only comparison left. You know, one of the subjects to an item that was run with two contributors and it was running with three contributors. You compare one each individually and then you give results for each run individually or do you? Uh, you can make all the comparisons simultaneously, comparisons, excuse me, simultaneously and you can view all those results at once uh, in what's called a match table which summarizes all the results. So all this is done inside the computer, and it sounds like it's getting into the millions of calculations at this point for, for comparative analysis. After that, you're getting information from the computer telling you results? Yes, the comparisons would be the results. And what do you do with those results? I compile them and record those results in our case notes, and I prepare a case report where I summarize those findings, and I also prepare a case packet which has all of the data supporting those conclusions in the report that are provided on disclosure. And you did all that in this case? Yes, I did. And everything you did in drafting the report and putting your case together, did you follow all your procedures as directed by Savage and <coughs> Yes, I did. And was your work reviewed? Or did, did it fall under a technical review? Yes, when I draft a case report, the report or the case is reviewed by two analysts independently to ensure that protocols were followed. Um, after those analysts perform their review, the report goes to the Chief Scientific Officer of Cyber Genetics, Dr. Mark Perlin, who does the final review. And then after that, everybody signs off that they agree with what the computer did, everything did appropriately and then whatever conclusions are reached, everybody reviews. Correct. And were all the findings that were reported in the report, they appear to be consistent with the uh, procedures drafted and the science that applied to the procedures? Yes. Now, when you put together a case packet, done with this. What was it? The case packet contains all the supporting data for the conclusions in the report. So it includes pictures of the data, it includes the uh, genetic types uh, that were inferred by the computer and their probabilities, it uh, contains the comparisons that were made and what those statistics are. Um, the match tables, which summarize all of the comparisons that were done, as well as error analysis um, in that case packet. You uh, also provide some uh, means of somebody to double check the work, or they can do, uh, like, check the data in themselves if they so wish? Yes, in disclosure, Cybergenetics provides a license key to the software, so whoever has that license key can visually interact with the software themselves. 
Um, we also provide the digital DNA, electronic DNA data files that we were provided in order for whoever wants to review the data can do so using those same files. And I assume there's been validation studies, as you said, on the software that's used. Do you provide those also in the, in the discovery? Yes, all validation studies are provided on disclosure. So you pretty much provide everything you can to make sure everybody understands what happened. Yes, we try to be as helpful as possible so anyone can understand the mechanism and the method that is true allele. And all these findings, everything was produced in your report. Do you know the date of the report that was done? Yes. May I consult my notes again? Sure. Thank you. The date on the report is January 11th of 2019. So it takes about a month to do everything. It depends. If there is um, a rush on the case, we can also accommodate that. contributors to the uh, DNA mixtures that they had in this case? Yes, it did. And did it identify uh, contributors that could represent, could be representing some of the samples? I'm not quite sure what you mean. In some of the samples that were tested, did they identify, we can identify a profile of somebody that would have contributed to some of these samples? Yes. And was that also provided in the data? In the disclosure, yes. Electronic data files, yes. And the electronic data files, you take a look at those for your own view. Yes. And you make a decision then at that point as to the amount of degradation in the sample? Not quite. We can turn on the setting for Trulio to consider differential degradation, which is a little different from degradation of the sample. Differential degradation considers that the contributors are degrading at different rates whereas degradation just means that the sample as a whole is degraded. And these samples as a whole are degraded. May I refer to my notes again, please? Sure. Thank you. Most of these samples appear to have some uh, degradation. And with all of these samples, you assume more than one degree. Uh, EO2 was uh, only one contributor, but for everything else, correct. Why was EO2 only one contributor? That's what Does the data. Relevant <laughs> that is what the data looked like that didn't appear to have more than one contributor. Okay, so you look at the data and then you make that decision as to how many contributors you're going to use. Correct. Okay. And whether or not you're going to click the differential degradation. Yes, that is standard protocol. And the default setting uh, for truly on the program is actually 10 RFUs, right, for peak height? Yes, an analyst can set that lower if the data appears to be um, lower than 10 RFU. And so you have to go in and manually it down to five. Right, that's one of the settings that the analysts 
uh, sets before uploading that request. Well, not that the end, so not that you. You did that. Yes, process. that I can <laughs> set. And you could actually go down to zero. Yes. So when you say you want to use all the data, you pick a number of five, because most of these at least were put, whatever was there was over five, right? Right. You also removed, turned off a couple of peaks. Correct. On which items? On EO5 and EO8. And which peaks? On item EO5, I turned off peak 10.1 at locus BWA, as well as for EO8. On EO8, I also turned off peak 4.2 at locus D13. And you say turn them off, turn it off so the next run it doesn't consider that you don't even see that. Correct. I ran it both with and without the peak. Because in your opinion, you made, you made a judgment call that was an artifact. It's part of protocol. When it appears to be an artifact, you can run it both ways and then look at both results. Okay, the question was, that's what you did. Yes. Correct. Did you ever move the peak height below or above five bars? No, it consistently stayed at five. And the most contributors you assumed on any sample was three. Okay. Uh, four on item EO9. So up to four people on item EO9. Yes. And you answered council's question about whether uh, you have a profile of someone that may have contributed. Uh, traditionally, when we talk about a DNA profile, we're talking about two alleles at any given location, right? For course, my DNA profile is going to have no more than two alleles at any given location. Correct. That's not what you have here. Right. When Trulio infers an evidence genotype or genetic type, um, the method is to assign probabilities to the different allele possibilities. So there are more than uh, just two alleles for a contributor genotype. In fact, on some of them, all of them were represented. In other words, every allele at, or, yeah, every allele at every location, SE33, for instance. You know, out of the final question, this is now going into analysis and results. Mm -hmm. What was the question? Well, in some of the, at some of these locations, every allele is represented, right? So not just two, you'll have four, you'll have 11, you'll have 18. Right, with some probability associated with it, um, which is what the method uh, ends up with, and that's what Dr. Perlin will be explaining. Okay, but I just wanted to be clear, when you say you have a profile, it's not what we think of traditionally as a profile. In other words, traditional DNA analysis, I only have two alleles at any given location. Right. And it's not like that, is it? No. Yes. 
Um, I'm not sure what item though. I can't see that. Oh, yeah. These are true allele electrophorograms, not the Bode electrophorograms. Correct. Okay. And what we're looking at here up here says we need E is this item E01. Is that, is that what we're looking at? Yes. Like E01 over here. And, okay. My only question is these these numbers here in the boxes, do you put those in? No, that is from True Allele, the computer software. Okay. And what stage of the process is that then? Putting the numbers in the boxes? Yeah. Uh, that is done during uh, the analyze process when we upload the, um, the electronic data files. True allele uh, sizes that data and determines what the peaks are. And we've seen a few of these, unfortunately. And the y axis here is the, the RFU. Is that right? Yes, that corresponds to the amount that is present in the data. Okay, that's it. Thank you. No. Anything else, Mr. Gee? Right. Okay. Any objection to the goals for you, please? Right. Okay, thank you for your attendance and your excuse. <laughs> and you call your next witness. Yes, the people who call Dr. Mark Herman. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, you can take this in your room, too. I will. I'll be speaking softly. That's why we have one for And you do have water up there in case you need it? Uh, yes, I do. Dr. Perlin, what is your current uh, occupation? I am Chief Scientific and Executive Officer of Cyber Genetics. And do you have any formal training or education that will help you attain the position you're in now? Uh, yes, I do. And could you please detail that for the jury? I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the State University of New York in Binghamton. I have a PhD in mathematics from the City University of New York. I have a medical degree, an MD, from the University of Chicago. And I also hold a PhD, another doctorate in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And do you have any uh, prior employment before cybergenetics that's related to uh, what the work you do at cybergenetics? Uh, yes, I was a faculty at Carnegie Mellon University in computer science for 10 years uh, preceding uh, uh, forming cybergenetics. And so you formed cybergenetics? Uh, yes, in 1994. You, um, are you part of any professional uh, organizations or associations that are related to the field studied or uh, applied in cybergenetics? Uh, yes, a member of three professional organizations. <clears throat> the one I'm most active in is the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, where I give presentations at their annual meeting about uh, the scientific work uh, that I do uh, most every year. And I also publish and review uh, articles for their Journal of Forensic Sciences. Do you have any honors or awards that are related to your work at the U.S. Cybergenetics? Yes, uh, the most one of the most recent ones was a year and a half ago. 
which was uh, the Foundation for Improvement of Justice in Georgia, presented me with an award in Atlanta for the work uh, that cybergenics does on pro bono uh, exonerations. Can you say that? So it would be like an innocent project type uh relationship to where uh, there's some kind of work or investigation done to see if there's somebody who's wrongfully convicted? Yes, not, it doesn't have to be through any particular innocence project, but it's for helping to exonerate the innocence through a more informative DNA analysis using computers. Do you hold any patents regarding the analysis of D DNA and uh, genotyping? Uh, yes, I have about 10 patents. And any of them stand out as the most significant of your patents that you're um, uh, used on a daily basis? Uh, well, for the work that we um, do today uh, in separating uh, DNA mixtures and unmixing them into genetic types, uh, there were patents that uh, Cybergenetics filed about 20 years ago and started issuing uh, maybe 15 years ago on uh, how computers can unmix uh, mixture data. Do you, have you written uh, any publications that are peer reviewed on the subject of DNA analysis? Uh, yes, I have uh, about a dozen publications in that area, <clears throat> and uh, six of them involve the testing and validation of the system demonstrating its reliability. And you have other publications that aren't peer-reviewed as well? Uh, e yes, uh, most of the papers that I write, well, some, that, for example, there are conference papers, and so they're accepted, uh, they're written, they're, um, they're published by a conference proceeding. I wouldn't call them peer-reviewed, uh, but they're not just a document that I write. I have... Uh, over 30 peer-reviewed papers. A peer review is a process where scientists conduct a study or describe a method. They send it to a journal, and it's independently assessed by uh, two anonymous reviewers who determine its suitability for publication. And what are the general topics that uh, you write on that are peer-reviewed regarding DNA analysis? Um, uh, genotyping, uh, which is developing uh, genotypes or genetic types from DNA data um, on artifacts, on methods of uh, mm -hmm. calculating error rates, so uh, one can determine the reliability of a DNA match statistic. I write about uh, DNA match statistics and also on um, tests that, uh, that assess the reliability of computer systems that conduct uh, the unmixing of DNA mixtures by math and computers. So to do this type of work, it sounds very technical. What kind of background do you need to really be involved in the work that you do? It would be good to have a background in computer science, uh, mathematics. Um, a statistical modeling is helpful uh, in that uh, to model with probability, uh, the equations that are written are something called Bayesian probability uh, that can describe uh, different uh, measurable uh, outcomes in terms of probability. Uh, it's good to have a ba some background in molecular biology to understand what the processes are uh, and uh, how these data are generated uh, in a test tube, in a laboratory, uh, from the original DNA, because that's what the modeling is all about. It's describing uh, mathematically how data is formed from the laboratory process out of DNA samples. Now, you were involved in the forming of cybergenetics? Uh, yes. And to form cybergenetics is part of the uh, business model involved the development of computer software and the healthy analysis of a DNA mixture, DNA data. Yes, we began by developing the software technology. And when did you start developing that technology? There are earlier versions, uh, some of which are still used in the system. For example, analyzing the raw data files to find the amounts of DNA and which different variants they are called alleles. 
uh, that was uh, developed in a, in a true allele system for reference samples uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, the mixture separation program uh, we started working on 20 years ago. And when you say we, were you involved in the actual coding and programming of, of part of the software? Uh, yes, I wrote um, all of the modeling of the laboratory experiment, that type of probability modeling, and a lot of the uh, match comparison software. There are other programmers who've worked on user interfaces and um, supporting parts of the system. Now, in cybergenetics, we heard from Mr. Pujols that there's uh, protocols that are necessary for the use of the uh, software cybergenetics. Are you involved in the creation of those protocols? Yes, I developed the initial protocols, and then over time, um, and uh, process supervisors and the staff uh, took them over and refined and added to them. Approximately how many pages is protocol for the staff to use, or to any user to use when using uh, software from uh, The basic protocol is over 100 pages, but there's also uh, about 10 user manuals uh, for the true little system of varying length uh, that describe how to use each part of the system, um, not as a protocol to follow, but as uh, as a manual on how to operate the software itself. And it can operate like a reference manual too, so if you're at a point you're like, okay, I'm not sure what to do here, you can look it up, kind of like a, any kind of user manual. All right, it's a user manual for software. And you mentioned True Allele. Uh, is that the name of the software? Uh, yes, it's um, spelled capital T, lowercase r u e, and the all one word, capital A, L L E L E. And allele is a genetic variant or type, and so the trademark name is True Allele. And exactly what is the True Allele software? <laughs> Uh, the True Allele software uh, is a client-server type of model. That means it's in two parts. Uh, a person operates uh, True Allele on their computer screen in the client software uh, where they can enter data, they can ask questions. When the computer's finished, a user can review results. There's also a central server. It can be a computer on a desk. It can be many computers in a server room, or it can operate uh, in the cloud on the internet. And that's comprised of a central database that houses the data, the questions, and the answers, as well as uh, many parallel computers. In our office, we have about 100 processors across maybe 10 computers. And each of, the, each of those work on one question uh, given the data and the question, when it's done, it writes its answer to the database. And the type of software, I don't know if you said, is it uh, probabilistic genotyping? Is that the term that's used for it? Yes. Um, with a definite DNA profile, um, there's one possibility that the data shows that a person would report. So a person uh, would at a particular genetic location would have a pair of alleles, one from each parent, and that would be a definite profile. But most evidence is uh, not that definite. Mixtures and low-level samples can have uh, many possibilities. Uh, say there's about 100 possible genotype values. Um, and older human-based methods from, say, 10 or 20 years ago would simply report that the evidence was uninterpretable, inconclusive, insufficient, and no use was made of that evidence. Uh, with the concept of probability being introduced, once there's more than one possibility, computers are used to determine the probabilities of each answer, and that preserves the evidence, but now there's not one uh, genotype value, there's a list of them with the probabilities, and those genotypes that have fuzziness or probability can then be compared to calculate match statistics and to what extent people are associated or not associated with an item of DNA evidence. Now, 
you develop this software to do what you just described. I'm just trying to summarize it. Um, was there a need for it in the justice system for such an analysis? Uh, there's some relevance. Some low level DNA. Okay. Is it fair to say this type of software um, deals with low levels of DNA to help give it an interpretation? Uh, yes. Uh, whenever there's any, when there's more than one possibility, when there's some uncertainty that the, um, in the evidence as to uh, what the genotype would be, whether it's a small amount of DNA or there's two or more contributors, uh, there's typically more than one possible answer that can explain the data. And a scientists at cybernetics and maybe 10 other companies or groups around the world, these probability methods of probabilistic genotyping assign probabilities to the possible outcomes so that the data isn't lost to criminal justice, but it actually can be used as DNA evidence. And this is evidence that in general terms is used to uh, identify suspects or perpetrators. It can be used to identify people and show an association. It can also be used to um, show a non-association and to uh, conclude that their a known person is not did not leave their DNA on an evidence item. Uh, the same technology, when uh, genotypes are inferred, uh, can be used in the absence of any comparison to form databases or determine how informative the DNA evidence is, and comparisons can be done at a much later time. The use that you just described that the software can do, how does that differ from human or manual interpretation that was used before the software was developed? Um, previously, if there was um, more than one possibility, or with some simpler methods from 20 years ago for looking at, method, at, at mixtures, um, all possibilities were looked at but given equal weighting, which wasn't what the data was describing, uh, those methods tend to discard most of the evidence. So in published studies, 70% uh, of evidence items would be lost uh, to criminal justice and be declared inconclusive. Uh, when the methods for mixture analysis did get a result, uh, the results were, were found to be less informative and often uh, give the wrong match statistic. So over the last 10 or 20 years, these probabilistic genotyping methods, including cybergenetics true allele system, um, have been able to preserve evidence and that otherwise would be discarded with human methods that would make all or none decisions and would generally work on only the simplest um, DNA evidence. Yeah. True allele um, to be used in a criminal justice system scenario, you have to be validated. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yes, there are uh, requirements uh, that are uh, given by the FBI and um, other national groups uh, that would require uh, the laboratories going to use a method, uh, for example, that the method has to be validated, it needs to be tested on uh, a range of different uh, representative data, like mixtures, and uh, measured uh, and reported what error rates are, uh, how effective is the software at finding someone who's actually present, how effective is it at showing that somebody who isn't there really isn't there, and also how reproducible the method is. Reproducibility is important because in natural processes and with probabilistic systems, uh, when you run the computer twice, you don't get the identical answer. There will be random variation to solve a high dimensional problem. And so when you run the problem, the, the program twice, uh, will you get numbers that are within a factor of 10 of each other, like a million or 10 million, which would be reproducible, or will you get wildly disparate numbers, like one and a trillion? And so those tests are done uh, to establish that the program's not just um, detecting the right people and uh, rejecting the wrong people, but it's also statistically reproducible. Those are the three main types of tests that national standards groups 
recommend for probabilistic genotyping. And how many times has Trulio gone through that validation process? Uh, there are about 35 validation studies that we, or crime labs, or uh, master students, or collaborations have done. Uh, and uh, seven of those are published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, the other uh, 25 are reports, um, all of which um, are available and have been provided for uh, review in this case. Do any government agencies use uh, TrueAllele in their uh, data analysis of DNA data? Yes, there are about 10 crime labs that use TrueAllele routinely. Uh, the first lab in the United States to ever use a probabilistic genotyping was uh, Kern County in Bakersfield, California. They went online with TrueAllele in 2013, and uh, they use it today for their uh, routine uh, laboratory analysis of uh, DNA evidence that otherwise they wouldn't be able to interpret at all. <clears throat> it is, uh, how many states is, has TrueLeo been used for either for cases, analysis, or reports for criminal cases? Uh, Trulial uh, Cybergenetics has issued reports in 43 of the 50 states and has gone to trial, I think, in about 20 states so far. Uh, but of course, crime labs in their own states who use tr Trulial, um, they issue their own reports and they, they testify about their own results who are not involved. So can you give certifications to then other uh, agencies or other bodies to use Trulial? Well, we provide education, uh, so the same sort of training that Beatrice uh, described, of uh, having basic operator training and then uh, having uh, more advanced training is something that uh, most laboratories that use Trulio will ask uh, cybergenetics to offer as a course and provide certification for. And when they do that, do they also buy licenses uh, for the software? Uh, yes, uh, Trulial, as I said, has a client-server model, uh, so many problems can be solving at the same time, and then based on the number of uh, analysts who'd be using Trulial at the same time, that's the number of licenses that a lab would buy. So if you have, say, four analysts uh, who would be using the system, they've been trained and certified, then a lab would have from two to four software licenses to concurrently uh, work with the system, um, any user interaction. So there's something called source code. You know what source code is? Uh, source code is uh, a computer program that's in the form that's written by people that people can read, share, and understand, uh, and uh, document uh, that can then be interpreted uh, by a computer into the program that's actually run on an iPhone or a computer. That's the executable program. And do you make the source code available to anyone? Um, in a criminal trial, there's an, as part of our four gigabyte discovery package that we provide, there's an invitation if a group is interested in spending eight and a half years reading, reading through all that text, they can come to Pittsburgh and under confidentiality, they can read it. But on that same DVD, we also offer the opportunity for um, the opposing group to test the system at no cost to them. We'll set up an, a cloud server, provide them with all the manuals, which actually they have already, show them how to operate it. If they wish to conduct a validation study, like the 38th validation study, um, and on whatever data they'd like, they can do so uh, to test the reliability of the system. Uh, that would take, once they've read the manual and uh, done the tutorial, that would take a few hours as opposed to a decade. So scientists usually test systems on data instead of reading documents. And did you make the same offer to the government in this case? Um, yes, we provided them uh, with that disclosure DVD with those invitations. And did they come out to your lab in Pittsburgh uh, to take a, a tour, I guess? Yes, they, uh, three people came out, um, they learned about Trulial, we discussed the case, we fed them 
we pointed them to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, where they got to visit our historic dinosaurs and other things. Uh, but we spent four hours going over the system, and I answered uh, whatever questions they had. Yeah, do you just give the software away? So anybody can use it, like open source code? Uh, no, we don't give the software away because then we go out of business. What we give away is the opportunity for people to run it at no cost to them so they can test it and see how it works. Is that similar to other software like Windows or Adobe Acrobat where it's proprietary? You have to pay for it to use it. Correct. Uh, most software that you use on your iPhone or your laptop, whatever you use, you don't have source code. Uh, you don't even have an offer to review Apple source code, um, which Cybertronics <laughs> does offer. What you have is a program, and you can test to see if the app um, works or not, or or how well it works. I mean, there are, there are weather apps. I don't know how accurate they are, but um, some are more accurate than others. Now, we heard from Mrs. Kuhlholz that there's a uh, protocol and control parameters associated with true allele. Um, you said you were involved in developing the protocols, correct? Uh, yes, I developed the initial version and I've um, developed some of the sections in that operating protocol. As part of those protocols and controls, um, does the interpretation include the use of any population uh, databases for comparison? Yes, so we'll see this later. Um, when I'm, after a uh, genetic type or a genotype has been separated out of DNA mixture data, it can be compared with another genetic type, typically a reference sample from a person, though it could be other evidence. Uh, in making a comparison between an evidence genotype and a reference genotype, that determines a probability of match but that has to be divided by uh, how often that match occurs. What's the chance of a coincidence? So a match statistic in DNA is the chance of a match divided by the chance of a coincidence. To determine that chance of coincidence, uh, the FBI and the federal agency and the Commerce Department, uh, called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, develop DNA databases that sample uh, genotypes from the population, uh, maybe a few hundred people, and the data that they gather can be used to calculate the chance of a coincidence. So, I was kind of thinking about this. So you want to see if the results match what you kind of expect based on the population, correct? Well, it's not what you expect. Imagine there's something that's very common, um, like you see a photograph that's evidence. You see a photograph of, um, of a person of interest, and the, the feature that's being matched is that both people have a face. Well, 100% of people have a face. So, for the most part, like 99.99999%. So, the fact that there's a match isn't something to jump up and down about. We've got a match because it's a very common feature like most people have these. So instead, you need to divide it by the chance of a random match. What's the chance that a random person would have a face? Well, that's one. If you divide one by one, you get one. And, and, and a match statistic of one is telling you there's really no information there. If a match statistic is a million, that's telling you that the match is a million times stronger than coincidence. It's probably a real match. If the if there's a very bad match, if the number is one in a million, that's pointing away from that match having even, even being there. So it's always important to know what coincidence is. Uh, and with DNA evidence, match statistics are reported. Uh, they're usually required, and they weigh the chance of an, of an actual match divided by the chance of a coincidence. That coincidence is to the probability is determined by these population databases. And without uh, accounting for the chance of a random person having a, a particular genetic type, it wouldn't be a valid match statistic. And the same type of uh, weight is given when 
human analysis happens as well, and they calculate out a DNA match, they have to use the same weighted statistics, do they not? Yes, they also use population databases to work out the chance of a coincidence. Uh, the limitations with human review is either A, they're not reporting anything at all because it's too complex, or B, they're using methods that spread probability over many impossible uh, solutions and they end up with very low match statistics or inaccurate ones. But they have to consider the chance of coincidence that is developed from these population databases. Now these top population databases, where do you get that information from? There are uh, published studies from the FBI lab, from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, in many states, the state lab, DNA lab, will also uh, construct a database. And these population databases give you that denominator, the frequency of occurrence of, of, of a coincidence. If you um, use one or the other database, the match statistics don't change much. They're usually within a factor of 10. Uh, but there can be reasons like which DNA kit was used, which genetic uh, locations were used. Uh, you'd want to use a population database that included the tests that you did. Otherwise, you couldn't uh, make any conclusion on uh, one of the 15 tests that were done. Now, we heard Mr. Kuhl uh, discussing the different <coughs> parameters that can be set uh, on a run for true allele. Uh, you, you listen to that part of the testimony? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And she listed out multiples of contributor numbers, the peak height. I won't go through the list. Um, does the work at cybergenetics, do they intentionally skew those parameters to try and force a result that you want? Uh, no, the whole point of true allele is that, uh, we, that we don't know, the computer doesn't know or care what the result is. When it separates out genotypes from the mixture data, um, that genotype can be compared against one, ten, or a million people and just produce a match statistic of to what extent someone's present or absent. Uh, crime labs typically don't use all their data. True allele has mathematical modeling that can get down to the very, very low data. So a choice doesn't have to be made. It's just used. If the data are very uninformative, if peaks are very low, the computer factors that in and uh, discounts that uh, mathematically. Uh, and a typical uh, output file, there's a scale of 0 to 10,000 uh, fluorescence, relative fluorescence units. Uh, crime labs will uh, discard data at a level of maybe from somewhere from under 30 to 300 and not use the little level data. The, the noise itself, like a background hum, that's just noise and doesn't represent genetic events, is typically at around 10 RFU. So it's one part in a thousand. And we typically will run uh, true allele with, with that level set in the noise of uh, 10 RFU. Uh, when the data are very low, uh, we want to make sure we're not missing something, and we'll drop it to far 5 RFU um, on that scale of 0 to 10,000. There are some cases when the data can get incredibly low, and the signal may just not be much above the noise, and there we'll drop it to 0. In this case, the data were low, but they weren't abysmally low, and so we went under the background noise, but not all the way down to zero. Reducing the parameters into the background noise, has that been validated? Um, yes, we've done tests at cybergenetics where we vary what the background noise is of zero, five, or 10, and we see that when there's more DNA present, it doesn't affect the answer. Um, we won't raise it above 10 because part of what true allele does is it models the background noise so we don't have to throw out the data that might contain someone's DNA. So we like having some background noise. Uh, we just don't need all of it if there's a lot of other DNA present. Now, changing a little bit, um, can you tell us the computer 
to assume the inclusion of a uh, known subject? Um, you can. That wouldn't be somebody you'd be comparing with. For example, in a sexual assault case, um, we might get low-level data from a three-person mixture. Uh, we would run the computer making no assumptions and identify that the victim was present through a large match statistic. And then if the question is, what about the other two unknown contributors, one of whom might be an assailant, um, and that is not the victim, it makes the math problem easier for the computer to assume the genetic type of the person we've already identified. So instead of having the computer looking for three unknown people, now it's looking for two unknown people. Actually, that process can continue. If you identify um, uh, the victim's partner and they're not involved in a crime, and, we, and the computer can identify them as having left their DNA, we can now ask the computer, well, assume the victim, assume a partner, now look for the one unknown that might be the perpetrator's genotype. So that process can be repeated um, once we establish that somebody has left their DNA. But when we assume someone's DNA, we would never compare uh, to report a match statistic with the person we assumed. Uh, that wouldn't be logical. Now, are there regulatory bodies that oversee the work that cybergenetic does? Um, yes, at the FBI, they have a group called SWGDAM, S-W-G-D-A-M, which is a mouthful already, but what it stands for is Scientific Working Group on DNA Analysis Methods. They've been around since uh, before the year 2000, and they issue various guidelines to crime labs and other uh, DNA analysis labs on how to conduct human review, on... Uh, certain methods that the FBI prefers or they like using in-house. In 2015, they issued guidelines for the validation of probabilistic genotyping systems that would include true allele. And does this SWGDAM, so it governs both human uh, interpretation and computerized probabilistic genotyping uh, interpretation, correct? Yes, it has different sets of guidelines. It had guidelines for a one-threshold method for mixtures in the year 2000. It introduced a second threshold for human review in the year 2010, and also began mentioning probabilistic genotyping as uh, an alternative. And by 2015, it issued its first guidelines that were solely for computer review based on a probabilistic interpretation. So... The work that is done at CyberGenetics using true allele, that has, in the policy manual that was written, that's all within the governing guidelines that's established by uh, SWGDAM. Well, starting in 2015. Uh, before then, groups uh, that were using true allele, who were crime labs or cybergenetics doing uh, consulting work, uh, had done studies that were very much what SWGDAM ended up adopting. So SWGDAM represents the DNA community, the crime lab community. So it, does, it doesn't just make it up. It looks at the studies that people have done and then incorporates them into their guidelines. And that's what happened in 2015. Uh, our, the studies that we had done by that point uh, had pretty much satisfied all their guidelines. It was a matter of just documenting uh, the 30 or 35 studies and how we responded to each of the 30 um, suggestions and show that those validations have been done by other labs or by cybergenetics. And the guidelines by SWGDAM that govern human interpretation versus probabilistic genotyping, how do they differ? What are the different parts of the guidelines that are good to highlight? Well, they have different philosophies. So with human review, the question is if the data are less informative, can can human review produce an answer at all that might not falsely include someone? So those guidelines are guidelines about how to throw out a lot of data. If you run 20 tests, maybe how you would keep eight of those tests and be able to use them in a match statistic. Uh, whereas with computers, the guidelines are different. 
it does more of a presumption that a computer will try to use all the data. And the question is, when using all the data, is the computer finding reliable results? So they're geared toward different methods. Human methods discard data, computer methods preserve data, and so the guidelines are written about different topics, one for human and another for computer. Now you mentioned earlier NIST, I believe it's N-I-S-T? Uh, yes. And what is NIST again? Uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're, they used to be called the Bureau of Standards many years ago. And they do all kinds of things, atomic clocks for measuring time and um, length, whatever you can measure. And they have a, a group for applied genetics. And their group uh, has looked at different approaches for forensic testing. Uh, originally, just on the data that was being formed, and then more recently, on the computer systems that interpret the, the evidence um, after the data is already formed. Does NIST use uh, true allele in any way in establishing standards? Uh, they have in the past. In uh, 2011, NIST had a true allele system. One of the things that NIST does in developing standards is they'll develop a standard DNA uh, reference materials, SRMs, standard reference material, that crime labs can buy. They'll have a known DNA sample, they'll have a mixture uh, in known quantity of known DNA samples, maybe a 70% of one person's DNA and 30% of another person's DNA. And then labs can test that their systems are working well on these NIST standards that they buy. In 2011, um, NIST used its true allele system to establish or verify the accuracy of their mixture sample. It verified as a yet another approach using computers that the composition of the mixture, um, the relative proportion, as well as the genetic types that they thought they'd put in was accurate. So at the time, uh, the standards agency was using true allele to help develop their DNA standards. I don't think they continue to do that, uh, but they were doing that eight years ago. Witnesses, testimony, exhibits, parties, or attorneys, and we'll see everyone in the next